السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته خيار تهودا دا غلاص عطاء ميالك السود دولي دا كنجوكتان كسو نوانا برنامج كاريمها بلشوه اسبوع على دين كاقي ايمانا يدق مدى ايلين قارحان تاول من هول كيذا برنامج كاريا ديرن دا وحال غصارا يا وحب برنشضا اي عقبالها دبا صوفو سارا واري دين تا الصوماليات او اي يقول لقن ايو وحب برنشك كدو وانتن هالكا اللوها يا انت بدن اي ودن كي هو يكلا يميد ايه ويبع عقبالها كلا صوفو سارا اوبت كا الصوماليات او كا كا عبريا عنصر النماء يكوها يان معلمين تعدان كا واسي ايه غار كوها هذا الكون لغانا ايه ولي بينا يسن بتنشال كوضا مرنا مقاني كرنين ما دابا يسن هلنين رول موضل ايه دل ايه كون ديدان او تصالا وناكسان ونقضا حدا موحا نسوع عسل ندد كا تلما ايه كا قوضا ايه دقما دا ايه لين دود دي ايه حدا مسيدا لولا عدي وحا نجعل هاي انت هانا دود دا ايه دين كي دين كي نحب حنين داوشا ديدا ايه انا محد عالين قارا هو دو مريح حوالي دد دحب الشيل وايدو برنامش كاري مها ببلشان ايسبان سرقريسي ونو ايه دي ايه محد عالين ايه نو او كو عام بحالي هفنان ايه هاو كرنمو لمان بلاح ديدا ايه معاميش ايه وحا نولا انا هاي Thank you very much. That was our one. Still, we have a long way to go, guys. Because uh, still, you, still, you have to slot this one. You know, are you black? Are you white? Are you Asian? You know. But when you go to school, you have the same aspiration, whether you're Asian, white, or black. You want to succeed. And it's very difficult, really, for somebody coming from uh, a war-torn Somalia for the last 23 years, and to say to, you know, somebody comes at the age of 16 or, or 14, when they come here, they go straight to the class age-wise. Not do they speak English? Do they know the culture? Do, do, do they know the weather? You know. And whenever I see mainly mothers, and really, really, we congratulate you, mothers, because you, know, you are the ones that are actually you know, keeping the family together. And uh, in the winter, you know, taking from GP, from school to tutorial, and a lot of achievement by the Somali actually, you know, young people is mainly due to the mothers, you know. They really work hard, so we salute you, Ab absolutely. The other thing, you know, we have to make sure, you know, and ask why, you know, we have some sort of, some failures, definitely. We have a lot of success. And here, we are not here to actually have always negative, negative, you know. We have a lot of young people going to Oxford University, Cambridge University, Russell Universities, you know. So we have to celebrate, and we do celebrate on a yearly basis. I remember, I think uh, 2013, a young Somali girl, you know, passed two alif, a, two alif GCSE A star. And she was told, you know, she wasn't really making that, you know, progress, you know. So that shows really, you know, where there is a will, there is a way. And, you know, there is a lot of successful stories in the Somali community and beyond other, other communities. So tonight, we're not here, as Abdul Hafiz said, to criticize anybody, any school, but we want to be in the fold and be asked exactly, you know, not only told what we need really, because, you know, sometimes, you know, I mean, you might have more experience with your child, you know, so if the teacher tells you exactly what to do, you can say, well, look, you don't know him really, but why don't you try that one? And a lot of, some schools, you know, have some sort of, you know, negative impression when you ask certain questions. And we are here really to tell them that, you know, we are not here to criticize you really, because there are other ways, you know, we can actually, you know, contribute. I mean, the first thing is, you know, the young children should have role models, you know, they, have, they should have aspirational leaders, really. And there is none. You go to school and, you know, there is no teacher, for example, even let alone the senior level, but also at the lower level. It will be nice. There are a lot of Somali graduates, a lot of African graduates, and other, you know, nationality actual graduates, you know. But they are never in the teaching, you know, profession. And I urge you, we have got two young ladies here who are Som Somali teachers, one primary and one secondary. You know, we should have more you know, teachers, because then they will tell that, you know, if they can make it, you can make it, you know. This is for labels they bit you, you know, ignore it really, you know. Where there is a way, you know, there is a, where there is a will, there is a way. The question I suppose everybody's asking, who are we and what are we trying to achieve? We have come up with a name, and it's this long, <laughs> and it's the Black and Ethnic Minorities uh, Parent and Teachers Focus Group because I think it has to encompass everybody together to try and harness the essence of what is good. And there is good in all of you, in all of the Ealing community, but unfortunately, they're not all recognized. And when we look at school results, 
I could speak for hours, but I'm not going to. We're going to have other meetings for this. Today is an introduction, and we're hopefully going to be taking questions later from all of you. But let's just say that the ethnic minorities in Ealing are not, on the whole, meeting the national average. And this is a benchmark that the government sets for what is acceptable. And this is not acceptable to us. And because it's not acceptable to us, we have come together as a community to show that we do not accept this. And we want more of an opportunity. So how are we going to get this? We're going to talk to all of you. Every single one of you has a story to tell. And we are going to share those stories with everybody else that we know in the community until our numbers are greater than they are now. Because education and children fill us with emotion and this is the catalyst for change. And I believe this is our time. You know, we have sat down for far too long and we need to stand up and be counted and be recognised for our worth. And we have so much. I feel so passionate about this. It's almost difficult to express into words, which is why I didn't write a speech, because I would have missed so much that needs to be said. Um, so if I can convey how pleased I am that so many of you have come out and ask why do we think that Ealing is failing our children? The mums, we have heard from Councillor Gulaid, your work is invaluable and it is unrecognised. And the children that have been achieving the most aren't pushed and supported to achieve more. Um. I'm really here because Abdi Hafid um, told me that he was organising this meeting tonight and he quite rightly guessed that it would be something that I would be very interested to come and listen. I'm here really tonight to listen to what uh, the Somali community is saying about the schooling that they're getting um, in Ealing and, um, and that's something I want to be able to take away and think about and then I can talk to Abdi Hafid and others about how I think I might be able perhaps to help a little bit. And um, one of the first things that was brought to my attention when I had a meeting with um, the local Somali community in Acton, we had, a, we had a meeting at the Food Palace, it was probably about two years ago now, and the first thing that was explained to me was, of course, that many people from a war-torn country like Somalia come here not to fit in with the ages that the schools are prepared to take. They come at all times, and their children may be any age, and then they've got to take part in education, which has been marching along in its own routine, and they have to try and fit into the schools as best they can. And clearly, when there's a language problem, which there's bound to be when they first come, the, the children aren't going to be expected to understand everything in the classroom, that is clearly going to be something which is going to hold them back a little bit. And that was something that was very clearly explained to me, and I, and I really take that on board. I, it's difficult to work a way around it, but it probably suggests to me that there does need to be some extra support and help at that important stage when we are, we are introducing uh, new Somali children into their schools to make sure that they can absolutely take part 100% in what's going on and then start making use of the education to get on in life. Um, what we did talk about at that stage was whether or not we could find some, sun some Saturday schooling that might help to boost the education in terms of language skills and that kind of thing. Um, we were trying to find some premises where that might be able to take place. It was explained to me again that there are plenty of skilled teachers in the Somali community. It wasn't so much the teaching that was a problem, it was finding a place where we could do it. So maybe that's something, again, that we can think about. If, if you still think that Saturday schooling would be an additional support to help bring on the skills. Um, but as I say, I, I absolutely understand the issue and I can see that it must be very frustrating uh, for, for parents to see that their children aren't quite there with the rest of their class because they've arrived late and they haven't mastered the language skills. Um, I do know 
very well how talented the Somali community can be. I've uh, met many talented Somalis as and, uh, I've been uh, working in my constituency and we need to make sure that the children who are now living here get every single chance to take their place in this community and do as well as I know many of them are going to do. We have to make sure that they are skilled to the maximum. And I'm here to listen tonight and I can assure you I'll take away what I hear, think about it and see what I can do to help. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, I, I heard that actually meeting you had two years ago, but you know, we have to actually make sure, you know, become inclusive. We have here ex portfolio holder for uh, education, young ch children and also young people. We have got the current actually uh, cabinet member who is also the cabinet member for children and young people. And I think the best thing is because as a councillor, you know, and I'm so, first of all, councillor, as you know, uh, we actually have a lot of actually, you know, effort as a council to make sure actually, you know, young Somalis succeed and we're spending enough money, whether it's expansion of schools or what have you. So I think we have to make it across the political spectrum and make sure we work together really rather than making you know, the whole thing political because at the end of the day, we want to help the young Somalis and the others as well. Okay, without further ado, let me call Mohammed Ibrahim, who is the inclusion and who will give us inclusion and achievement data and he's the chairman of the London Somali Youth Forum. So there are trends or themes going through the country and, you know, and through schools that we have been aware of, uh, that we've been monitoring for a long time. Um, and those themes um, relate to some of the impacts of uh, the exclusions can cause. And we've been in discussion with headmasters, uh, teachers and parents, and I must add also young people. And um, so our evidence suggests when young person is excluded, uh, it may seem very simple, but the impacts are quite severe on the ground, I must say, um, leads to criminality and social exclusion. Um, it was interesting, I looked at stats from uh, the prison service, having met the uh, current Secretary of State for, pre uh, for, for, uh, for Justice. Um, most of these young people who are uh, in Offenders Institute have no background in terms of their GCSEs. They've left school or they failed their GCSEs. So it tells you uh, that the impact of social exclusion or even um, exclusion from schools or even lack of achievement in school, the impact it can have on young people on the long term. And there's also an issue of unemployment uh, because when a young person is excluded from school, uh, he tends to be frustrated for two, three years. Um, some of them start colleges. Uh, for about, I would say, six, seven months, and then they get frustrated. Um, and then before you know it, they enter a life of criminality. Um, so that means their overall um, outcomes in terms of employment is curtailed at early stage in their lives. So this is also some of the experience we faced. Um, and I think this data is also um, quite interesting, but quality of life, and also uh, in terms of health and well-being. These are young people that who are not looking after themselves. They are out and about in the, in, in the evenings and nights. Some of them uh, sleep with their other friends in different bars. Uh, their parents are widowed at home. Um, so in terms of the overall welfare and quality of life is one that is diminished uh, in the short run and in the long run. And I must also add, uh, there has been some cases of um, young people who have... Uh, some people who have uh, moved on to actually quite dangerous paths of extremism because of exclusion in schools. And this is a discussion we've been having um, with the Home Office and also the local authorities. Because if a young person is excluded from school and um, frustrated for two or three years after being excluded, um, we know there are mad people that who can uh, um, utilise their energy in a dangerous path. And I think we have seen some case actually in London itself, uh, which uh, who's actually now missing, I must say. Um, he was under Tim's, uh, under the control orders, and then he escaped. So if you look at his overall background, uh, being excluded from the school, and I must say that school was in Ely, um, and then he ended up uh, being an extremist where you know, he went through a control order, and then he escaped. So we have seen some, uh, some, some obviously a few cases 
that um, that had relationship with exclusion from schools. Um, and there's another issue, two issues actually that is uh, not mostly talked about, which is the impact on family. Because for us as a community, from a Somali context, um, when a young man is excluded, um, he's, he's actually, he's the future for that particular family in terms of uh, education, in terms of economic outcomes. And so him being excluded from school, he's also excluded a whole family from a life of economic prosperity and living, if you like. So in that context, the family also suffer. And the mothers that I meet also suffer uh, because they, they had a degree of empowerment in Somalia where they had control of their children. And now, and now at the moment, they seem to have lost that control. And when they see their children being excluded from the school or, 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 or in, the, in, the, in the degrees of you know, situation where they are going to be excluded and they feel they're not in control, they also suffer. Um, but they also suffer in silence. And I must also advise parents, please don't suffer in silence. Speak to your local schools, speak to local authorities, speak to your local MP. Because I've seen many, many parents, interestingly, who say, when I ask, um, where's your child? She's ashamed. She said, she once said to me, he's going to Somalia, but we know he hasn't. We know the data suggests he's in prison, but she's ashamed to talk about it. So I think we have to talk about some of these issues. So there's also an impact on the family. Um, and also, an overall, an impact on society and government spending. Because at the end of the day, uh, these young people who are excluded move on to difficult lives. And those difficult lives affect us as society, whether it's in the criminal justice uh, system or whether it's the uh, level of expenditure that we pay to, to, to pay for their services in prison or even in hospitals. So, sorry. Uh, so I would say these are two key themes that are mostly forgotten, uh, that we sometimes feel is not our responsibility, but I think is one that decision makers need to at least uh, discuss or policy makers. Um, I just want to uh, spend uh, a minute or so on, on two key issues that relate to exclusion, especially on BME uh, communities or even Somali communities. This is some of the examples I, I've come across in some schools. Um, schools have got discretion. Um, headmasters have got discretion, a lot of discretion to exclude or not to exclude young people. Um, the other factor I also want to touch upon is the issue of proportionate response. Um, when I looked at those two key issues in relation to the young people that we represent, um, I found that these two key issues are abused mostly by headmasters because I've seen many cases where there has been disproportional uh, response to a particular problem where there seems to be a knee-jerk reaction uh, to a decision making and that obviously in, involves a um, young person being excluded who then obviously uh, has a difficult life to lead. Um, so I would encourage most teachers and school, uh, school leaders to exercise discretion and, proportion, and proportionality uh, because I feel I've come across three cases that where I felt these two key issues were missing in the discussion. What I will try to do is picking up some of the, um, some of the um, comments that the other colleagues have made and, and give you an idea of what my experience was. So I finished the work in December and the British Council, it is published and it's on the British Council website. So um, if anyone is really, really interested, if any of you are like me and you don't have a life and you just want to spend your time reading and doing things, then you can ask um, Councillor Goulet and he will tell you exactly where you can find that. So British Council did not specifically ask me to um, speak to Somali parents. They, it was left, um, they wanted to know about all what they call migrant parents. Some people might say immigrant parents, basically people who've come from another country to settle here. And what I want to tell you is, I agree with so many of the comments that have been made this evening, but I want to tell you this. In my view, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and reading, I think many of the issues that these colleagues have raised are 
also experienced by all migrant parents. So basically we are all in the same boat in some ways when we come to another country and we want the best for our children, which is why we came to this country. We want the best for our children, we want them to do well. Whether they go to Oxford and Cambridge is up to them, I think, but what is important to me is that young men and women do what they want to do and what they're passionate about, as we have heard, and they should be given every opportunity uh, to do so. In our local university, which is just down the road here, my husband has worked there for many years and he told me, it's interesting, when we first came to Ealing in about 2001 or two, you didn't see very many Somali uh, students down there at University of West London. If you go down now, you will see lots and lots and lots in the coffee bars and in the libraries and taking part in the shows and so on. It's visible how many Somali young people are there. Okay, so seriously, I have a lot to say, so um, Councillor Gulaid, guide me a bit. What I did was, um, for my research, it wasn't only books, although I did that, I spoke to 93, 93 parents, 59 of whom not only talked to me, but they wrote out for me what they thought about their children, what they thought about the schools, what they were worried about, and what they thought that schools and the local authority and education professionals could do for them. I liked, the, I liked what the colleague said about the importance of the mothers. In my view, of the 93 people I spoke to, 92 were mothers and one, obviously, was a father. So I think that mothers are doing a brilliant job. I utterly agree with what people here said. But I think, if I may say so, it would be very, very good also if more fathers got involved with the schools and so on. Gamaran, Chevki, Yel, Acti, Kalumi, say, I'm a swift ad way, say, Oku addict, so eat the hab. I do go the man at the Gila Sea Ordan, say Asaya, Ugahilia, Adek, so eat the hab, Stimali, the hab, Marcasta, Ia Melcasta, Kuna Stimal, some tell. Can I ask a show of hands how many youngsters that we have that are still in school? See a few young faces. Okay, upstairs, up in the gallery, hands up. Those of you that are still, oh, we've got a, quite a bandit up there. Thank you. Um, and hands of you, hands up, those of you that um, go to tuition. Only one, wow, yeah, few down that. here. Okay, lovely, thank you, hands are down. And parents, if you send any of your other children to go to tuition centers. Okay, thank you. Um, well, the reason why I asked that question is because in my experience often I found lots of children, and not just Somali children, but children from black and ethnic minority backgrounds often do send their children to tuition. And it's for the same reasons that probably people from lots of different backgrounds will send their children to tuition centres. And that's principally because the parents don't necessarily feel equipped to support Okay, that's principally because those parents don't feel necessarily equipped to support their children um, with the homework, and which is why some schools often will run homework clubs and things like that, so children after school can go and attend these homework sessions. Now that's all well and good, that's great, but often I found the best learning comes from when parents, even if language is a barrier, which in some cases it is, sit down with their, uh, their children and just have a discussion, as um, the lady who spoke before me was talking about, and literally just have a conversation about what they did during the day, what they learned, um, and the child can then model what they've learned at school to the parents. And actually that's an incredible and very, very powerful learning tool because then that demonstrates to you that the child not only has grasped the learning that has taken place in school, 
and that they cognitively can understand it, but actually they're doing something very different in that they're explaining what they've learned. So that's also reinforcing the learning. So even if what the child is saying to you is gobbledygook, you know, if you smile and grin and nod and acknowledge that you understand or attempt to understand what the child is saying, that's also really a very, very useful tool um, to employ. Now, I was asked to speak about empowering parents, and I, I, I could talk about a lot of different things, but really what I'd like to do and what I'd like parents to take away from this is just a few strategies that they can do um, and practice with their children at home. And one of them is literally just have a conversation. It costs nothing, but it helps to build and form relationships. And if you consider that your child will spend the best part their most productive hours in school, away from you, and they're with their peers. Um, and if you add to the equation breakfast clubs and after school clubs, actually the time that you have together with your child is very, very limited. And you need to use those golden opportunities in the evening if they're not being ferried off to a madrasa or after school club or tuition centres. Really utilise the time that you have, so any window of opportunity that you have to conversate with your child. Um, and it's almost, it's almost if, if any of you follow the attachment parent um, philosophy of parenting, it's almost as though you're collecting, recollecting your child again after they've come back from the school gates. So that's one thing that you can do. But also bear in mind that the way children are taught in a tuition centre is very, very differently to the way that they're taught at school. So at school, some of the strategies that we try and employ is really less... Um, instructional. We're really more as uh, we act more as facilitators, which I'm sure my colleague will can back me up on. Um, and in that, what I mean is, we will ask the children questions, just as I did to begin with, just to gauge where the children are at, and then you will model. Um, what it is that you want the ch child to learn. And then you'll try to maximise the learning opportunity and then let the child <coughs> work on the learning for themselves. And often in, um, in tuition centres, what you find is children are working from workbooks. And that's fine as well. That's, that's the way lots of, that's a pedagogy that's used throughout lots of different countries. And that's fine as well. But that can sometimes raise a conflict because the parents will then come back and say, look, my child has done copious amounts of work. They've got four or five textbooks that they've completed in half a term. And yet when I go and meet the parents at parents' evening, they've maybe just got, they've completed one English book and one science book. And that's about it. But really, some of the learning that takes place is getting your children to think, and that's so crucial, and you cannot undermine that. When you live in a world where there are so many distractions, teaching your child to think for themselves, giving them opportunities to be critical, and also having dialogue at home where your child can voice their concerns and also be critical, even if that means that they're critical of your parenting style. I don't mean that, you know, they tell you to use a four-letter <laughs> word and slam the door. I'm not talking about that at all. But I just mean having an open and honest relationship where your child can come to you and voice those concerns. I had the opportunity uh, a few years ago to mentor young Somali girls, not very far away. I won't mention the high school that it was. And these were girls who were on the brink. They were on the periphery. Um, of being excluded. So I was actually called in by the head teacher and said, look, I have a, a core group of year 11 girls. Uh, there was about eight of them. And literally, they are on their last final, final warning. Any other incident, whether it's big or small, they are being turfed out. And if you can imagine being in year 11, you've got your GCSEs. And if you're kicked out of school, there is nowhere else that's taking you. Your opportunities dwindle drastically. And it's interesting, um, I had a discussion with the Senko. Now, these children did not have special educational needs, but because they were presenting emotional and behavioural difficulties, that's why the Senko was dealing with them. And before I went in, I was given a brief about the children and their backgrounds. And I, having read the email, I thought, oh, this is all pretty straightforward. They're only being told off for wearing makeup and, you know, you know they, they weren't bringing in knives, they didn't have drugs. It was none of the usual typical things that you might associate with being excluded. And I went in and I thought, oh, I'll probably only need about four sessions with them, maybe one session a week. 
Eventually that turned into two, uh, uh, an eight week session when we had a gap in between half term. Um, but it was actually eight sessions that I was working with those children. And the things that came out of that have left an indelible mark on me that I've not forgotten. And th these girls, their behaviour was, they were presenting challenging behaviour. They weren't fighting or anything like that. It wasn't anything, they weren't being aggressive. But it was very, very low level disruption. And anyone who is a teacher, that is probably one of the things that will drive you up the wall. It's that constant ebbing away, chipping away. Um, so it's like the things like calling out in class, which I was guilty of when I was in school a long time ago. Um, not so long ago, anyway. Um, but it's little things like that that they kept on doing. And I remember speaking to one girl and I said, look, why do you think you are going to be excluded? Because literally she was, she had actually, I had a session with her and she got into a fight at that lunchtime so she knew she was going, which is it's traumatic. But anyway, um, all her warnings were to do with not wearing correct uniform, not tucking her shirt in. I see some nodding heads. Not wearing correct uniform, not tucking the shirt in, refusing to take makeup off they were given Johnson's baby wipes, going to the bathroom and clean their face with, which, you know, anyway. Um, and various other things. So when you compile, although there's small incidents, when you compile all those things together, it forms a picture, which is that you are disruptive, that you do not listen to authority, that you are rude and do not listen to and respond to your teachers. So when you collect all these things, and that continues, thank you, and that continues to take place, um, then that forms a picture, which is that you then become very, very difficult. And the easiest thing for the school then to do is to say, look, we've done as much as we can for you. It's now time for you to go. So when I spoke to those girls, they didn't understand, you know, when they're 15 and 16 year old minds, they couldn't understand the greater picture. It's like, well, all I did is put on makeup. All I did was not tuck my shirt in and Miss is bullying me again, again, I'm getting this grief again. And I completely empathise and understand where they're coming from. But parents really, really, really need to understand that even though that's something small, when it continues to happen, it then becomes a pattern. And ultimately, the school will assert their authority. And if that means they bring out the big guns and they say, hey, you're being suspended or you're being excluded, they will exercise that right to do so. So bear that in mind. If your child's coming home and they're saying, oh, I only got kicked out because I didn't take my eyeliner off, you need to understand that in the school's view, that's a very, very serious crime in inverted commas. Okay, I've been told to wrap up. I could talk forever. <laughs> Thank you. We have got another high school teacher, Somali, you know, to our mercy. And uh, that's great to see so many young Somalis, all the boys. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you for inviting me, Abdul Hafid. Um, there's been a lot of things talked about today. I don't want to talk at you guys, but um, I've been asked to come and share my experience as an high school teacher and as a parent. So I'm going to briefly just say things that I've noticed that worked and others that haven't worked for me as a parent and as a teacher. Um, I'm so glad I'm actually quite, feel quite honoured to be part of the discussion. I hope other boroughs, I'm not from this borough, I'm from another borough, I'm not going to say what my borough is. <laughs> I'm from another borough and I hope my borough would do what you guys are doing and um, the fact that all the main stakeholders, people that can make the change and improve and help our children reach their potential yes, I'm are... A counselor. Yes, um, yes. Okay then. Um, yeah, we do. Actually, okay. yeah, we do have some ideas. Know what it is, okay, so um, I hoped um, that we would do, like the parents, the teachers, the students, the counsellors, policy makers, teachers, all present in one, under one roof and having a discussion. So um, I'm going to try my best to get my borough to do the same thing. Um, unless after half it wants to volunteer to come to our borough and do the same thing for us. Um, but yeah, so um, I have been a, well, firstly, I'm a mother. I'm a mother of four kids, actually. Three of them in school, um, one in high school, two in primary schools. I'm not born in this country, so when people say EAL, I'm as EAL as they come. Um, I came at the age of 10. I've been teaching for about four years. 
but I'm in the education system for about seven years. I started off doing another profession, but once I had my kids, I thought, let me go into education. So um, the school I'm at, which I'm not going to name, um, has a really large um, number of Somali kids. And the things that worked for us, actually say similar to the kids in this borough, some of them are not doing very well. Actually, they're achieving below the national average they're supposed to. So some of the things that work for us um, would be things like Saturday school, which someone has mentioned. Um, we used to do that a lot. Parents meeting, um, I often do focus group for parents, um, which we have discussions like this. It's actually quite bilingual because you see me talking to the head teacher, not in English, and talking to Somali parents in Somali. And my Somali is not that good. Um, so um, there's that. After school clubs, um, what else? There's so many things. Initiatives. Um, that used to be brought on by the MTAS, which I desperately miss. The funding is gone. But um, yeah, and talking to parents, talking to kids. Um, I've had a lot of positive experience in the school I'm at. I've worked with great head teachers and teachers who have got the passion to actually push our kids forward that do not see whether you're Somali, yet white, um, white British, Asian, whatever, they actually put in the effort to teach our kids. And that isn't always the case. There are times, obviously, kids slip through the crack, um, where funding that's supposed to go to the kids that are in need do not happen. And I don't think Ealing is any different than any other borough. I'm sure some of the funding's not being used where it's supposed to be used for all our EAL kids or any other kids that are people premium that gets free school meals. Um, but, um, so those are the things that worked. Other things that have worked have been, um, I know my sister talked about uh, parents' empowerment and being involved. That's another thing. A lot of the parents are, everyone's talking about parents who, or students who have come into the country recently. Uh, I don't think that's the only sort of, you know, teachers or not teachers, students we're looking at, pupils we're looking at, because there's a lot of second generation Somalis that were not performing well. It's not just the EAL, English as an additional language, that's just come in, for lack of a better term, fresh off the boat. But not those only, we're talking about the kids who are born here, who have acquired the English language, should have acquired the English language, as their other counterparts have, but haven't and have slipped through the crack. So for those, I'd say the school, as Mm, as responsible as myself, as a parent is responsible, as the policy makers are just as responsible, as the government, oh, don't get me started on that, as the government is responsible, um, no, I'm just saying the government has got, they keep changing all the rules every year, um, uh, conservative, uh, okay, I won't say anything, um, <laughs> but yeah, the government's just as responsible, so is the teachers and as parents, it's a collective sort of effort, and us as parents, I can only speak for myself as a parent and as a Somali parent, even though my head teacher refers to me as one of the most, what did she say, um, well-informed parents she's ever come across. I have different to any other child, regardless of where you're from, but for kids who are from the um, black and minority groups, um, ethnic minority groups, so your child has been disruptive, so that's, it could be, it could not be, maybe it could mean that they're not being engaged, but School may not see it that way. They want to, might need to get rid of them, exclude them, which is unfair. So I could go on for ages, just like all the other people. But um, one of the best things that we need to remember, one of the things that I've learned for all the experiences that I've gone through, the positive and the negative, which are just as much positive. I do not want to discourage kids. Our kids, Somali kids, are bright, mashallah. They're extremely bright. They're creative. Um, I'm going to get emotional because I love my babies. <laughs> they're creative, they're bright, they're just as productive as any other member of the community. I don't like them being labelled or looked at and said, um, you know, because you're Somali, you can't reach a certain place. You, because you have, I don't know, a group of students who are maybe in another school or who are falling in through the cracks, doing criminal activities, you might, so if you can't say what you want to say, get someone else to say it for you. If you cannot say what you want to say, but you want to be tactful, find another way to say it. Say it in a letter. Let's say what we need to say and make sure you speak for our kids because our kids are worth the effort, trust me. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here today 
and it's really good to see so many of you here because one of my key um, uh, targets since I got appointed as councillor in May was to actually engage more with the Somali community and I was actually at the Greenford Hall event where you were celebrating your achievements and that was a tremendous event. So I hope to see you at many other functions as well. Um, I do want to touch on the social, uh, the school exclusion issues that were raised. Um, I think it's fair to say that the school governing bodies are responsible for setting their behaviour policy and exclusions from schools are reserved for the most serious offences. They do not just exclude people, as <coughs> one of the teachers said earlier. Um, in January this year, there were 1,700 Somali pupils attending Ealing high schools, 9% of the total high school population. That's not a very high figure. Somali pupils are not overrepresented in the number of permanent exclusions from Ealing Secondary Schools. I can give you some numbers. Since 2012-13 to the current academic year, there have been 122 permanent exclusions from Ealing schools. Of these, only six were Somali pupils. I won't go into the rest of the numbers, but I think it gives you an idea of the small percentage that we're looking at. So, but I completely accept the points that were raised about the impact exclusions have on families, not just on the individual. Um, also, Somali pupils are not overrepresented in the number of fixed term exclusions that we have over the same period for 2012 13 to now. Only 104 were Somali pupils out of 2,315. Where there are concerns about your child's school, these should be raised with the head teacher first and then with the governing body. There is no doubt in my mind that there, there are issues that need to be addressed, but I think we can do so by focusing on creating a much stronger home school partnership where both parties feel comfortable about discussing the issues. And I would welcome the community's views on how schools and the council can communicate more effectively with the Somali community. And I'm sure there are various channels for communication, so please come and talk to me. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Benderai. Uh, can I call now our prospective candidate for uh, Acton and Ealing, Dr. Rubahag. Ruth Rubahag is a lecturer in Kingston University. Look, my trajectory, if we come back to my trajectory, Bangladeshi, again, at the time was a young community. And when I went to school, when I went uh, to Notting Hill, this idea, people like us can't do this. You know, they fingered certain people that they thought would get into Oxford and Cambridge. I wasn't on their list because I didn't look like, my face didn't fit. But I remember at the end of the mock exams, I was getting higher than some of the other people that they had said, you will go to Oxford and Cambridge. And then I remember saying to the teacher, can I try? Because I'm getting more than them. Can I have a go? Can you put me in for it? Those people used to have extra coaching at lunchtime. I'd miss the extra coaching. It was so late before the actual exam. But they said, yeah, OK, it's only one place on a form out of God knows how many all right give it a go but be prepared for disappointment you know and all this and then in the end you know I, I did it um, and it's that breaking down those barriers because I've got a sister Connie Huck who's three years behind me she went on to be a Blue Peter presenter some people might if you're old enough remember Connie Huck again when she tried it wasn't like this big big door that you're knocking on because when you're a little person it feels like that so we need do you know what I mean more people to think we can do this and the people who have done it and you know I'm happy to talk to anyone here who's trying for Oxbridge or whatever or Kingston University where I now teach or Manchester University where I've been so you know we can totally do these things um, and you know uh, Abdul Hafid and others have highlighted many times it is due to Somali mothers who are putting everything into that uh, angle and making sure that uh, do you believe that some mothers spend 80 percentage of what they earn on improving their children's education and that is why and nobody has ever acknowledged it so what we need we need politicians to sit together and discuss ways to influence schools colleges universities to increase their intake 
of educated new graduates, would-be graduates into the, 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 the work as, as a workforce. I think that's what I would like to say. Unless we do that, we will be talking for ages with no progress. Thank you. I, I stopped and I thought about it. And I thought, how can they be? You have to look at the facts. No, the school is not racist. They may not have the, what we think are the very smartest black and ethnic minority groups representing in their senior, le senior leadership teams, but they're definitely not racist. And I have to support them and say, absolutely not. They are not racist. They have employed a lot of black TAs and a lot of black cleaners. So they're not a racist <laughs> school. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. By the way, I'm another teacher. Uh, I tend up, yeah, I'm, I'm a, sorry? No, in a different borough. Completely different borough, in the same school as Bar. I, uh, alhamdulillah, the, in, I came to this country and my parents were not with me. So in general, it was hard for me to actually learn. And some people, someone mentions that 16 years old people come in. It's not about whether you're EAL or not. It's, and it's how much you were, you're willing to work on your own as well, without your parents. So we have, I, have, I went to this school and I've worked in many different schools before I went to this school. At the moment, I'm a science teacher. What I'm trying to say is the parents, if they really want to make a change in, within their children, it's one day actually scared of the system where they say, oh, I cannot discipline my child. So I might have to bribe them, give them something, oh, he wants the next PlayStation, I'll give them that. Or I will get him this. Without that child deserving to get anything for a start. Second, the parents are not involved in the school. So we were blaming the schools. We're saying, oh, this school is this or that school. The parents in, that, in this borough, especially in Eden, I'm, I've heard they have a lot of Somali community, is their parent group or parent governors directly, which deals with all the schools, where they can actually speak to directly say, okay, we need someone from the school this was happening and the parents are in contact with the school so it's making sure that you are involved in the system and lastly to say to the parents is to understand that the school system is the kids are in the same class but different levels so your son can progress on age but at the bottom of the pile Krisha, my, my, myself I, i'm teacher i'm lecturer in university i seen it i work with community I have proof for you if you went to school is racist or not. The school is racist. Where they're dealing with the ethnic minority, black minorities, quite serious racist, especially in Ealing. I have two questions. Um, one is we've had these type of meetings hundreds and hundreds of times, yet there's not a single thing that has been done. There's not been a Somali person coming to a school seeing how it's going. There's nothing that. So, what makes this any different? And then secondly, and then secondly is to the parents. Things like parents' evenings, things like days that you should come in, that the teachers have invited you in. There's no Somali parents. I go to a school where the most you'll see is maybe two Somali parents that come in. So where are you? Like, what are we supposed to do without your help? The third meeting we ha we're having in this council, really, and I think before I was elected, you guys were actually looking at Ealing Council from outside. And now you're from inside. And also, if you carry on doing this, you will be actually listened to. It's your unity that makes the difference, not me or anybody else here or Abd Hafiz. It's actually exactly if you get together, you know, when I came to this council, there was 129 organizations in Ealing. Everyone wants funding. I said, don't give them a penny because they are all actually useless. Unless they form one, then we will give them. And nobody gets a, a grant from us now because you know, they have to get together, they have to have a gender, really, and a plan. So that's what you are trying to do. In terms of you know, mothers, they're doing a fantastic job, really, because you know, I know the results they're making. Thank you. The second question, Kagi Walalo. Are you talking about primary or are you talking about high school? Are you talking about primary schools or high schools? No. True that, okay. I must say, I don't, I, I don't know what you, where borough you're saying, but as a primary school, I should say, Somali parents, as you said again, ladies, mother's school, 
they constantly come to their parents' evening. <laughs> constantly coming to their parents' evening. They, even though they don't speak the language, they, they make sure they collect, they get their friends with them and say, speak up for me. They do not ask the right question, that's right. But they do attend the parents' evening to find out. That one, I guarantee you. High school, I could not say much about it. However, um, one of the issues we're dealing with here is not just about the Somali community and what they face, but the whole entire ethnic black community of Ealing are currently facing in terms of institutional racism, it appears. There is an issue where uh, it, it crosses all Ealing schools and the borough should or does need to take it quite seriously. The, the issues with what appear to be a case of institutional racism where teachers, parents, um, governors are facing particular issues around how their children are educated, about their opinions, about the way they try to influence schools in the borough, which don't seem to be taken seriously, in my opinion. Uh, my name is uh, Sebo so and I'm the, I, I do work in the borough on Saturdays for uh, a Saturday school, but I teach outside of uh, Ealing, though I live here. I think it's very important to uh, realize the problem in here. The problem is that when parents do go to school, how do schools treat them? In most cases, when parents do go to schools, when schools treat them, they reduce them to this much, thus making them feel very insignificant, thereby demotivating them from going to school in the first place. But just like Marcus has just said, there are more problems that we have in the borough that we haven't talked about today. You know, um, we, we live in the borough. We have kids who live in, who live in the borough that we work with on Saturdays. All these kids, they talk about institutional racism that exists in the schools, where these kids are not treated with the respect that they, they deserve. Even the exclusion that we talked about, whether it's internal or external exclusion, it doesn't matter. That I isolate a kid for a makeup for my classroom just because they're wearing a makeup or not tucking a shirt in, I just don't buy that for one single bit. Being, bringing in things like weapons into school, drugs and so on, that is understandable. But in terms of you know, a, a shirt that's not tucked in, and then that kid is isolated, put into internal exclusion, sorry, I do not buy that. Okay, and you will find that if you talk to people who have been through this, they'll tell you the same thing, that the reasons why their kids were excluded is just tiny issues that could have been resolved had the school engaged the parents. But in most cases, the parents are never engaged to a level where they will be rec their, their, their input will be recognized. Lastly, the other thing, the governing bodies we have in the schools, all right, we are not represented in there. And then the decision take, decisions taken in there, they affect our children. So I think it's time we, as ethnic minorities in Ealing, even the neighboring boroughs, we rise up to that and stand up for what we believe is right for our children. At the moment, we haven't addressed that. I take some of the comments that have been made today very seriously. Um, allegations of racism are taken seriously by officers at the council and by elected members and these are discussions that we've had from time to time in fact they're ongoing discussions i've also started um, visiting the schools and i have spoken to head teachers i've not spoken to all of them yet but i hope to do so and i know that the schools are trying desperately hard to communicate with the somali community they have coffee mornings They'd like more interaction. So I would say to you, as the young lady said earlier, where are the Somali parents? I suggest you actually visit the schools if you're not doing so already and take an active interest in what happens at the schools and what happens to your children. I think that would help us to form a very strong school home partnership, which we all know is absolutely critical to ensure the success of all our young people. Not just Somali children, we want all our children at school to be successful. And so I would urge you all to actually go into schools, try and understand each other, and try and form that very strong bond between home and school, which can make the difference between success and failure. At the moment, there are 90, 90, 90 vacancies for school governors in this borough and these are reaching out into the community there's even going to be um, an event here 
um, in the town hall uh, to talk to people about being governors and so on. I absolutely urge you, get applying for one of those 90 vacancies. No, I, no sorry, my, my point is simply about the, school, the representation of minority peoples on school governing bodies and there are 90 vacancies, so, you know, let's get applying for them. You can get schools with 100% white governors. That's not all guys. You know, whether, you know, I mean, you can go to another one with one associate governor. You know, so it's not actually the 90 vacancies, you know. I mean, Acton, there are about 70% you know, in one of the schools, you know. And we have to make sure, actually, you know, one of the reasons we actually set up this meeting is to start the ball rolling. This is the first meeting we're having, and it's a focus group. We should be going around and checking what the schools are giving and what sort of, you know, proportionate there are, senior, senior level, not TAs. Absolutely, you know, we have to make sure. But the thing is, you know, we have to know exactly the current status whereby the majority of the governors, you know, in a 90% actually, you know, the so-called ethnic minority, which I call it ethnic majority in this school anyway, are actually you know, non-representative. So we have to make sure we actually make representative. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm not on, not on the council. I'm not a councillor, so it's okay for me to mention a particular school, Acton High. Okay. How many black governors, ethnic minority governors, did they have on their governing body? None. Right. Right. The proportion of ethnic minority pupils in the school is what? 70 to 80 percent. Does it, does, it, does it make any logical sense that you can have a school which has an 80% ethnic minority population, yet still 0% of the governing body represents them at all? And that, is, that, is, that typifies what's taking place in Ealing as a borough. And if that doesn't make sense to anybody in terms of institutional racism, then this meeting or this forum is a waste of time. I would like to see more representation on the school governing bodies, but we're not going to get that unless we get applicants coming forward. And you have to also understand that each governing body has to look for a different set of skill sets amongst its complete governing body. So we're looking for people with lots and lots of different skill sets. Please come forward. Please go to the open day that we have at the town hall. Exactly. And then you'll be able to find out more. Let's readdress that balance of governors together. Mm. I mean, Sam's been a governor at Acton High before, Abdullah's been, but it's a four-year term, so I mean, if there are vacancies at the moment, I'd urge everyone, it's quite easy, you download a form, I think, on the website, and we can give you that address if anyone here hasn't got it. I mean, on the point about racism, again, I mean, what I was trying to say when I was standing up there is, it's not, Abdullah reminded me that when my parents first came to this country, there were signs that said, no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. You know, that was before race relations legislation. But as the doctor pointed out, we've got legislation in this country. It's all by Labour governments. That's the only people who've taken equality seriously in this country. And then just lastly, I mean, yeah, it's, it's the point of changing these stereotypes. I mean, we have a Black History Month. Why should it only be one month? It is very important that we, 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 we utilise and grab use this opportunity by grabbing the bull by his horns. The problem in here, I think we're kind of like going right around in circles, avoiding the problem, sort of going straight to the problem in here. The governors, post, the, the, the 90 plus what are called positions for governors we're talking about, they may just be associate governors, okay? In which case doesn't give them the right to vote. So basically, we are given the carrot, but it's not as the carrot as you know it. It's a fake carrot. We are not appreciated by the very same border we live in, we pay taxes in. I suggest that all the authorities in here, the officials from the council in here, they take, take initiative and act on this because we have teachers, who talk to us, who are being victimized in these schools. And guess what? They are of ethnic minorities. They have no voice. The head teachers have more power. If a teacher is victimized, how much more about the poor kid then? I'll, I'll, I'll come to you guys. I'll come to that road in a minute. Um, it sounds as if... A lot of us are saying the same thing because what we're talking about is um, the level. Everyone can get a job, but what sort of job are we looking for? And as you've just said, the head can make a decision. Um, there's 
board of governors, but there are those who, who are on the board of governors but haven't got a right to vote. Now, if you look at what's happening to some of the teachers, some of the senior teachers in this borough, we need to look at how they're treated. And when their issues have been looked at, it's the group of people who sit down and discuss whether he or she has been unfairly treated or not unfairly treated. Those group of people may not be from the minority groups. Those group of people may be of so senior level that we don't even get a chance to apply for those jobs because we didn't go to Oxford, we didn't go to Cambridge, or did we? Because we seem to sit, we used to be talking about where we went and what we did. It's what's happening now that we need to be concerned about. How are we going to help our young ones to move forward? Um, my name is Qasim Ali and I'm a geologist at the University College London. I graduated a few years ago from there. And what I'd like to uh, tell my fellow participants is that our community needs to, be, to unite for our strength to show. And what we used to do as an organization or what we're still doing as a worldwide Somali students and professionals is to take Somalis to go back home, those who are trained to help the country we left it behind. But um, res respecting our uh, communities and our members, we've realized the need for education in this country. And we work hard to get Somali professionals, those who are in different geology, in different um, earth scientists, doctors, and um, different professions to come together and help our community Therefore, this year, 2015, we are working on a plan to really empower uh, teachers and students to give them a, a role model style to show them that they can really reach as high as they want, go to Cambridge in this country, in the UK. So one of our events that we're planning to do is on the 27th of uh, March, 2015, next month at the University College London, UCL. So we hope to see all mothers and fathers come together and hopefully we can uh, sketch a plan to help our parents and also our children to aim higher and so that we can have a strong community in this country, those who can also do and do good for the countries we left behind, whether it's in Africa or the Caribbean. Because of this event, uh, surely this is needed, you know, the community in this borough needed this, to have this kind of discussion uh, where elected councillors and the member of MB um, parliament, uh, even though she's not here now, but was present earlier, are here to listen uh, what our concerns are. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Abdi and I work at uh, an organization based in Ilan uh, called Somali Advanced and Development Center. Uh, we are running a Somali project now. Uh, we work with Somali parents uh, where our objective goal is to, enab to enable them to understand uh, basically the process and the procedure and the system of the schools in Ilan. Uh, also, we work with young Somalis, the young Somali kids who are at risk because of some sort, because of exclusion sometimes. Uh, so therefore, uh, we to see this kind of event. I, 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 then as an organization, this is help us, and we see them as Somali parents nowadays are trying to empower uh, the young Somalis, uh, the peoples who are really not doing good or maybe underperforming in the school uh, because of other reasons. Somali parents are doing everything that they really need to do and they still see that their, uh, their kids are underperforming and they are asking themselves where this is coming from. So to have this kind of discussion, I think, it is something that the community needed. It's something that the Ealing Borough also needs to listen uh, from the Somali parent. Uh, to set the record, Ealing Council, Il Borough of Ealing houses 36 1,000 Somalis in this borough, 36,000 of Somalis, 4,500 Somali students in all schools uh, in Ilin, 4,500. That is 10% of Somali uh, students. So when 10% Somalis are in the whole borough of the students, and maybe 30 something of them, 30% of Somali students are underperforming, or maybe experience some sort of exclusion, even though th that's not a permanent exclusion, but some sort of uh, fixed exclusion. That surely says something about the community. That m creates maybe misunderstanding between the community, the council, the teachers, the school. And where this is where we play a role, bringing and make sure that the community and the school and the borough of Ireland understands each other, and to enable Somali parents uh, to make sure that they understand uh, the process and the procedure and how the school system in this borough works. There have been serious allegations uh, against Ealing Council and the respect of uh, racism 
and very emotive statement with a measure of evidence, certainly a verbal evidence, which has to be taken into consideration and cannot be dismissed. So I think that as the, the counselor who is responsible for education need to look at that. And although she said that, um, that her officers uh, are looking at this, the status quo is not satisfactory, evidently, because we're having problem. So there need to be some sort of review, logically, on those issues. Secondly, I would caution against um, just any particular community moving on the issue of racism. I, my caution is based on 50 years of experience dealing with this matter. I would suggest that any sort of forum that is prepared to challenge this very serious matter has to be a collective one, including Somalians and others, uh, other people from the Caribbean and other people from areas of Africa. We cannot um, ignore current affairs. I think it's important that it is seen that there's a joint effort on this matter. So that's the position that I have to say. Okay, I have, I have, uh, uh, I have to say briefly. I think if, if there is not something seriously wrong, you just look at the social mobility. People have been here for more than 20 years. Our children have finished secondary school education, went to university, and look at every single school, hospital, bank, building society, post office, even the councillors. Where are the people? Where is the real social mobility? <laughs> Honestly, I have to conclude my sentence. You need to sit together and talk about you got 36,000 people whose majority have nothing. And we are the educated group. We know that there is something that needs to be fixed. And if you do not fix, this would get stronger. It is legitimate. We seek regional and national solutions. It will not be very long when I call Eric, Bor uh, Eric uh, 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 head, head, head of government uh, unit for troubled families and minister of communities to come take it, sit sit together please sit together and ask yourself can we have a strategy to employ these unemployed people can we tell the school the largest school next year you have to employ three four somalis talk to the parents it will, within six months how many somalis are graduating and I have to also talk about other members of similar situation. Thank you very much. Universal is a symbolic, is one of the most useful TVs I have ever come across to. These must be spreading. And thank you for your contributions. Majority of the people, they're talking about Somali community. This problem is racing problem in every school. So what we need is to have not a, a governing a body in schools. We have a parent association in every school, primary and secondary, where we can have, the, where we can get a place that every mother or father or parents who have complained to submit their complaints. And we have to create a way of connection between that you know, association in that particular schools and the local uh, um, education department of the borough. Unless we have so, such a link, we cannot you know, solve this kind of problem. The other thing is uh, the Somali community. So, Alhamdulillah, we are talking about the Dajaya or Malika Ledoan Kadajaya. We are talking institutional racism in Malika Ledoan Kadajaya. But we are talking about the fact that we are talking about the fact that dana shacabkeen xafadaha ku kala nool si ta marka loo loo maareeyay in loo goor yimaado dadkiinan ee maxaa la yiraahdaa macallimiinta iyo ah inaga ama isticmaalayna ee linking kan qasim iyo ee dadkan professionals ka intii hore isu diwaan galisay isu diwaan galisay intaan isu diwaan galinayna baro walba isu diwaan galiyo si ay u sameeyno meel ay wax ugu hagaagno because meel wax loo hagaago ma jiro marka shirkaan halaga qayb galo wadna ma santiin been a frank discussion um, and there is a lot to deal with and it's impossible to deal with it all today 
Um, we did not understand the depth of feeling that um, the community feels, um, but we are going to be looking at ways of addressing this um, in a comprehensive manner. And there is something that schools do, and it's a government requirement, and each school has to report the number of racist incidents um, each month to the local borough, and then that gets filtered down nationally. And despite what you might think, or conversely, the schools that report the most incidents are the schools that are trying the hardest, who are aware, they are watching. And this is what we need to see. You know, if we monitor the figures of the schools that are doing this, we can see the schools which are doing the best jobs and address the issues um, like career path development for black and ethnic minorities. If we address this, there will be a lot of um, senior leadership um, roles taken up by black and ethnic minorities. And we can aspire to that. And our children can look. And this is how we make a proper change. Um, there was mention of joining governing bodies. It's great. My one question is, what is the average age? Um, but maybe we shouldn't ask that, sure. because we, we shouldn't be ageist. But let's say, put it a different way, what is the average length of time um, that a school improvement officer can be linked to a particular school? I'll give you the answer, it's four years, because um, the LEAs have done research, and after four years, they believe they go native, so therefore, they limit it to four years. So, if we look at governing bodies and their effectiveness, um, let's look at Obama. He's allowed to run for two terms, because he sits in America, and that's it. Over here, we don't have a limit for a prime minister, as we saw with Margaret Thatcher and others. Um, <laughs> so if we look at reform, we should start looking at the reform of governing bodies and look to see how long does a chair sit in a school and if we were to carry out a study to get those figures, you would be surprised that some of them have been there for 25 years. And we're talking about change and moving on. And it's going to be very, very hard if the institution is embedded within the schools through people that are like immovable objects <laughs> who keep doing the same thing over and over again. We need to get together and change. We need to join and we need to be full governing body members. It is no good one black or ethnic minority governor joining a school. I know how that feels. <laughs> but it's a very useful role and it's a very worthwhile job and I really do echo the words um, that Patricia Walker um, was using and we must get involved of Binderai, actually. Um, we must get involved. And with the parents' associations, we must get involved. And, and I think that there are um, cultural responsibilities that we have to be non-exclusive and to be more inclusive. And if there is a section of, the, of um, a Christmas fair that doesn't have alcohol, it is more inclusive than a traditional English Christmas fair or summer fair where alcohol is dotted about and they have um, all sorts going on. So we should look very carefully for um, specific figures so we can actually talk about what is happening. Career path development for black and ethnic minorities is, should be standard, should be standard. And if institutional racism does not exist, those people are already in their places and we are already looking up to them and we are here for no reason other than we have nothing else to do tonight. But I thank you very much. And this is the first one we actually compiled the Somalis 
and all the black ethnic minorities really because as Somalis, you know, we cannot do things on our own. We have to actually unite and actually get exactly, you know, what's wrong right. And thank you very much. این تا و حالا کسی که بگویم نبرد رابیش کاری ما بولش رو این تان هولی دین که گیم آنها مانت سمرکی اوجور رئیس حال کن برد رابیش کان لوق قبته نماهن حتی او حیالیه لگا و دخله یا او حکم ده هستی دادوینه هست سومالیه دایو که الهاین اوبت کوده یا مستقبل کوده این سکول دن ولش شقین الهاین اسلام رهان تان حق کوده یو صلاح سن الهاین برای دین تسلامالیه دایا لگا فریا این ای سکول ده حق ایو کلیه این ای کس صلاح سن ایستن عند مرتی اوجان نقل مستقبل کوبت کوده حالا ما دعیلی هد مانت که کس غیب جلی و هر کام وظیفه دیه آمریکا نو کمی دیه ای احساب تکرار فرابدن وظیفه دیه ای کنسل عبدالله گوری دو اصل و هر بدن کسوش غیر هر کان سام هدیه محمد ابراهیم هدیه معلمین تن حبلها الله وظیفه هدیه ای انتی نو کلیه کس و دقیق جلی انسان و کنار کل دیبو کل مدونه و عبدالحفیظ محمود شامع ای تیم کی نورسال علی ناجی محمد سعید ای ولی بو وری عبدالرشید رشکون لجوج آدمانو مهد علی نه تاس و کل انسان دیبو کل مدونه تقوی الله مینی مسلام علیکم و رحمت الله